wonderful um, introduction. Um, so, I, oh, where do I sit between these two? Lines? <laughs> <It's> interesting. Okay. <laughs> How about that? Um, I am. Uh, yes, well, I'm not going to give the talk that I thought I was going to give. <laughs> I feel like it's a good idea to be, um, to try to respond a little bit to what's been happening in the past 10 days, uh, as Mark put it. And I think, um, hopefully, what will come out is a little bit of this object-oriented feminist methodology, although I'm not going to be talking explicitly about object-oriented feminism. That makes sense. Um, I just want to thank everyone, um, the culture, uh, David, Mark, Eldritch, Ted. Um, He's right Ted, here. Ted, <laughs> Ted, <laughs> Ted. <laughs> Got it. Uh, <laughs> um, and I, also, in absentia, Rebecca Sheldon, who is somebody who's also been involved in object oriented feminism. Um, I just thought that the call for papers was such a kindred provocation, and I'm really um, excited to be here at my first Tuning Speculations. <laughs> so um, without further ado, um, here we go. Like many, oh wait, hold on. Like many, I'm going to start my <laughs> timer um, so that I don't go crazy here. All right, there we go. Um, so like many, I've needed to begin the work of detuning myself recently in the wake of the US presidential election. It feels like the true thing that I need to speculate about at this moment is this urgent defamiliarization that I'm experiencing, the realization that my environment has suddenly shifted politically, socially, ideologically, culturally, and yes, conceptually. I feel nervous on the subway in New York because things, including people, are not what I thought they were to the extent that I feel maybe I don't have perspective. This incapacity to congeal perspective is unsettling. I'm suddenly not sure what I'm looking at, whom I'm speaking with, where I'm going. I'm suspicious and insecure, depressed and defensive. So, what I would want to call the occult sympathizer in me um, does not want to spread that to all of you. As Rebecca might say, bad vibes. So simply put, it feels irresponsible to speak without perspective or to act in any way as though anything is normal. So I've decided to try to take this personal detuning into account in speaking with you today. I will be trying to be um, somewhat true to the things that I said I'd be talking about in my abstract, but I want to engage in an open and unformed reflection and try to include recent events so that we can see together where things land. My hunch is that context collapse, communicative capitalism, and decelerationist aesthetics are deeply enmeshed in what's happening right now. But rather than deliver you an analysis or a synthesis as I had anticipated, this talk will be much more sketch-like. I'm going to try to bounce off of all of these ideas while keeping them fragmentary, as though they are markers or beacons. To use a sound metaphor to treat this talk like a form of radar, to try to let these objects respond back to my detuned invocation, and hopefully stitch together an intuition of this suddenly strange terrain that's now enveloped us to become where we unexpectedly are. So I felt that this detuned talk deserved its own name, and instead of post haste, the title will be Speaking Volumes. I'll be offering you nine fragments that will reflect a couple of <coughs> themes, size, speed, and silence among them. And connecting to my work in object-oriented feminism, you'll hear an overarching concern with finding opportunities for human and non-human solidarities. So let's begin. Pretty crazy, fragment one. That's how Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg characterized the idea that fake news stories on Facebook might have influenced the outcome of the US presidential election. On November 10th, 2016, two days after the election, Zuckerberg gave an interview at the Techonomy Conference, and yes, 
that's the name of the conference. He stated, quote, personally, I think the idea that fake news on Facebook, of which it's a very small amount of the content, influenced the election in any way is a pretty crazy idea. He then went on to say, quote, I do think that there is a certain profound lack of empathy in asserting that the only reason someone could have voted the way they did is because they saw some fake news. If you believe that, then I don't think you have internalized the message that Trump supporters are trying to send in this election." Close quote. With this, I find myself in the highly unusual and deeply counterintuitive position of actually agreeing with one of Zuckerberg's statements. <laughs> Spoiler alert, it's not the first one. So for the moment, however, what I want to do is flag this idea of empathy and return to it later because I think that this notion is really key. I also think that Zuckerberg is dead wrong in his first assessment of the political impact of fake news on his network. I believe the effect is rampant, no matter whether it is a very small amount of the content, and Zuckerberg crucially fails to comment on what the engagement factor is for fake news stories, which is a far more significant metric, even on Facebook's own terms, than their mere number. And for what it's worth, so as I've been writing this over the past 10 days, the, like everything is changing constantly. So just on Wednesday, two days ago, BuzzFeed analysts revealed that, quote, top fake news elections, uh, sorry, top fake election news stories generated more total engagement on Facebook than top election stories from 19 major news outlets combined. This reflects how rapidly these things have been changing in the past 10 days since the election. Indeed, even while Zuckerberg was repeating this claim on Sunday, insisting that 99% of news on Facebook is authentic, a group of renegade Facebook employees had formed an off-the-books task force and already started meeting in secret to address the company's responsibility in a matter they regard as not crazy at all. Moreover, Facebook has an ill-defined role when it comes to news in general. This past June, the company re-engineered its news feed algorithm to, pro to prioritize posts from, quote, friends and family first, and secondarily posts that inform and that entertain. Yet a great deal of informing takes place on this social network. According to a Pew study this year, 62% of American adults get news on social media. This is over three times as many as the two in 10 who get news through print media. And Pew found that a staggering 44% of the overall US adult population gets their news on Facebook specifically. Nevertheless, Facebook has maintained steadfastly that it is not a media company, insisting it is and has always been a tech company. I'm going to argue that for this and other reasons, Facebook is very much a media company. In this, I find myself in good company. Numerous articles have made this assertion and Facebook has even involved itself in online journalism debates, conferences, and industry best practices fora. I am also going to be arguing what I imagine is at best a minority position or one that is, to my knowledge, under theorized. I contend that this split identity between media and tech reflects an internal conflict at the core of Facebook, one that is latent and growing in volume. Consider the, that the role of a media company is one of working editorially whereas we could describe the role of a tech company as working algorithmically. Extrapolating this dynamic, the core split in Facebook could also be framed as a conflict between the personal and the data-driven, or if you prefer, the subjective and the objective, or we might even say the human and the non-human. Fragment two, context collapse. Indeed, Facebook has of late found itself in a human, non-human, or personal, data-driven quandary. On April 7th of this year, the information ran a story with the headline, Facebook struggles to stop decline in original sharing. Fortune ran with, Facebook users are sharing fewer personal updates and it's a big problem. Well, Bloomberg technology put it rather more bluntly. Facebook wants you to post more about yourself. <laughs> 
As the Bloomberg article explained, quote, overall sharing has remained strong according to Facebook. However, people have been less willing to post updates about their lives as their lists of friends grow. The term for this phenomenon is context collapse. The notion draws from sociologist Irvin Goffman's seminal 1959 book, The Presentation of Self. Goffman theorized self-presentation through a theatrical metaphor in which individuals are akin to actors who pass between front stage and backstage regions of a theater, presenting different behaviors appropriate for the different audiences they encounter in each zone. People gear their behavior by instantaneously interpreting myriad silent social cues, presenting changing, but importantly, no less authentic localized versions of self, customized for context. For example, a conference room at work might present a front stage region, while a smoke break might let, workers, uh, might let coworkers relax into backstage roles, and so on. Social media collapses Goffman's unique and various regions, requiring the presentation of one self for all audiences. In their study of context collapse and imagined audience on Twitter, social media theorists Alice Marwick and Dana Boyd explain, quote, the requirement to present a verifiable singular identity makes it impossible to differ self-presentation strategies, close quote. Along with Michael Lesh, an anthropologist who studies context collapse in YouTube, Marwick and Boyd reinforce the important point that the continuous negotiation of self-presentation is a collaborative process involving constant interactions with others. <coughs> Goffman calls maintaining face and saving face, face work, and for obvious reasons, it is performed most fluently in face-to-face -face communication. According to Marwick and Boyd, <coughs> removing the instant facial feedback of an interlocutor creates tension for the individual, and Wesch characterizes this as anxiety. Marwick and Boyd describe how, quote, social network site users adopt a variety of tactics to contend with context collapse, such as using multiple accounts, pseudonyms, and nicknames, and creating fake stirs to obscure their real identities. Close quote. Note that these coping strategies are barred from Apache by Facebook's own um, real name policy, which The Guardian has called, quote, a bold-faced effort to define Facebook's own context as one that helps marketers and advertisers identify people, but at the expense of the well-being of its most vulnerable members, close quote. At the time of their study, which was published in 2010, Marwick and Boyd observed on vast sites like Facebook a quote unquote lowest common denominator effect with individuals posting innocuous content aimed at simply not offending the greatest number of their contacts. That was six years ago. To Facebook's dismay in 2016, whether they are vulnerable or anxious, users are responding to context collapse much more drastically by self-censoring personal posts. For the company, this poses a serious problem because as the Bloomberg article notes, quote, original personal content is the fuel that helps power the money machine at the heart of its network, close quote. But there's something going on here that's not just about the bottom line. Context collapse can also be understood through the lens of decelerationist aesthetics. In decelerationist aesthetics, the aesthetic forms of objects defy the accelerationist imperative to be nimbly individuated. In this aesthetic sense of the word, um, so incorporating properties like size and volume, forms can resist or undermine capitalist speed and immediacy by taking back and taking up space and time. From this perspective, context collapse may be the direct result of Facebook's success and growth. This is the first sense of speaking volumes that I want to invoke. Facebook users and their friend networks have grown volumetrically to the point where this, the sheer size impedes their business model. The data has gotten too big for its britches. Facebook has tried numerous tactics to entice users to keep speaking despite this volume. 
which is to say, to keep posting more personal content, the soylent green of its enterprise, if I can borrow Karen Gregory's phrase. As mentioned above, the newsfeed algorithm has been re-engineered to prioritize friends and family. And while I'm singling out Facebook, I just want to note that the platform is not alone in this. Snapchat, for example, recently changed its format, placing user stories in the quote-unquote prime real estate at the top of its feed and moving the publisher stories below. So Facebook has gone even further by rolling out new features aimed at promoting um, personal content creation. These include on this day memories, which prompts users to repost personal content from the past, something of a desperate move, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> photo syncing, a controversial and now discontinued feature that automatically showed smartphone camera roll photos near the status update. Um, friendship anniversaries, which reminds users to just celebrate the fact that they have friendships. <laughs> and, and of course, the mother of them all, live video. Live encourages users to stream a video, thereby creating original one-off content that, as Zuckerberg gushed, is, quote, really raw, personal, and spontaneous. <laughs> so, <laughs> while Facebook users are certainly availing themselves of these features, it appears it is not enough to reverse the overall trend of decelerated personal sharing, which remains correlated to the number of friends in an individual's network. <laughs> Ten years in, the platform has grown to the point that many users have accumulated a crufty decade's worth of so-called friends from far too many segments, or in Goffman's terms, regions, of their lives. Quote, for users confronting context collapse in, on Facebook, wrote The Guardian, the withholding of personal anecdotes and information isn't a problem, it is a solution. As tech writer Nicholas Carr um, calls this, it's not context collapse, but context restoration. Mm -hmm. But recall that the Bloomberg article states, overall sharing has remained strong. This begs the question, what is all of this impersonal content that so many users are sharing? Fragment three, memes. Speaking of news, here is another headline for you. This one from an August 24th New York Times Magazine article by John Herman. <clears throat> Inside Facebook's totally insane, unintentionally gigantic, hyper-partisan political media machine, how a strange new class of media outlet has arisen to take over our news feeds. Herman reports on what he calls, quote, a new and distinctive sort of operation that has become hard to miss political news and advocacy pages made specifically for Facebook, uniquely positioned and cleverly engineered to reach audiences exclusively in the context of the newsfeed, close quote. While well, Facebook's newsfeed algorithm selects from multiple media sources of varying political orientations, missions, and scopes, Herman's focus was on a rising group of political Facebook pages, which he explained, quote, are news sources that essentially do not exist outside of Facebook, close quote. On Tuesday, in a, vi a viral list, Tuesday of this week, right, a viral <laughs> list of 141 false, misleading, clickbaity, and or satirical, quote unquote, news sources began circulating online, including some of the sites that Herman investigated and scores more. Herman describes them as, quote, 2016's most disruptive and least understood force in media, close quote. So in the past 10 days, as I've been working on this talk, there's been growing media attention on, uh, about these fake news outlets and Facebook's role in promoting them. But uh, now what I want to do is focus on Herman's August article. And if you'll bear with me, I'm going to quote from him at some length. He writes, quote, Individually, these pages have meaningful audiences, but cumulatively, their audience is gigantic, tens of millions of people. On Facebook, they rival the reach of their better-funded counterparts in the political media, whether corporate giants like CNN or the New York Times, or openly ideological web operations like Breitbart or Mike. And unlike traditional media organizations, which have spent years trying to figure out how to lure readers out of the Facebook ecosystem and onto their sites, these publishers are happy to live inside the world that Facebook has created. 
Their pages are accommodated but not actively courted by the company and are not a major part of its public messaging about media, rather an understatement. But they are perhaps the purest expression of Facebook's design and of the incentives coded into its algorithm. A system that has already reshaped the web and has now inherited, for better or worse, a great deal of America's political discourse." Close quote. So I'd like to focus on two points in this passage. First, the description of the Facebook ecosystem of content providers being happy to live inside the world of Facebook. And elsewhere, he describes Facebook as less a partner than a context for news. These all suggest that we must understand Facebook not as a tech company, but as a media company, even in this highly traditional sense of medium, that, um, being a medium that supports a form of life, albeit in this case a non-human datalogical one. Even more significantly, to call these pages the purest expression of Facebook's design and the incentives coded into its algorithm is Herman's most compelling claim borne out through a methodology that involved tracking engagement through the crowd tangle tool, locating high engagement pages, and interviewing their creators. A tool for publishers, crowd tangle shows engagement on posts, knowledge that then arms publishers with the insights that they would need to generate content to meet engagement targets, in other words, monetary targets, right? Um, the engagement feedback loop, loop that results may, as The Verge suggests, quote, explain the eerie sameness on the web, close quote. So, wait for it. CrowdTangle was acquired by Facebook on November 11th. The notion of engagement is incredibly important to understand. To employ an industrial analogy, if original user-generated content is Facebook's preferred raw material, fetishized now with diminishing returns under conditions of context collapse, then user engagement, which in the world of Facebook means likes, shares, and comments, is the chief processing mechanism for transforming raw content into value-added user profiles, the ultimate Facebook product that is sold back to advertisers as sets of highly specific individual preferences which can be monetized via targeted ad advertising. So Herman puts it this way, in the Facebook news algorithm, quote, value is both expressed and conferred through the concept of engagement, close quote, which as he correctly points out, is something that all media companies have sought whatever the platform, but only with the advent of platforms like Facebook are, quote, the incentives now literalized in buttons and written into software." Close quote. The pages Herman studied have mastered the Facebook algorithm of volumetric user engagement. Many are amateur home businesses that pull in tens of thousands of dollars monthly while evincing no concern for journalistic principles, accuracy, or quality control. Commenting post-election on the role of social media platforms in Trump's victory, former Facebook product designer Bobby Goodlatte wrote, quote, news feed optimizes for engagement. As we've learned in this election, bullshit is highly engaging. This is where decelerationist aesthetics comes in again. There are multiple ways to code for engagement. Facebook's newsfeed does so explicitly through a bias that favors size. For example, Twitter also codes for engagement, but its algorithms reward spikes in speed, not size over time. This is a point that Caitlin Dewey makes in her Washington Post article, Why Didn't Hashtag Freddie Gray tr Trend on Twitter? I suggest that by favoring size, Facebook has not only created conditions for context collapse, which also exist on other social networks like Twitter and other platforms, but has bred viral bullshit content that has grown to dwarf anything resembling the personal. Herman recounts how a business model that gained momentum on the left through the Bernie Sanders campaign traffics in hyper-shareable memes, images overlaid with provocative text. Herman characterized it characterizes meme and clickbait producers as, quote, a strange new class of media organization that slots seamlessly into the newsfeed and is especially notable in what it asks 
or doesn't ask of its readers. The point is not to get them to, uh, to click on more stories or to engage further with a brand, which is what um, maybe traditional media would be trying to do. The point is to get them to share the post that's right in front of them. Everything else is secondary. <coughs> Bullshit may be highly engaging, but everyone knows that cats rule the internet. <laughs> so it is only natural that political meme image statements are booming. It makes sense to consider these posts the righteous, inflammatory cousins of lol cats. And the meme aesthetic could not be more ideal for, cap for um, capturing accelerated engagement, the currency Facebook's algorithm most highly prizes. It is my speculation that Facebook native political pages and, face and fake news sites are so wildly successful because they are filling the vacuum left by context collapse. They give users something else to share, a stand-in for personal expression with little personal vulnerability attached. If we return to the industrial model in which personal content is raw material, Facebook's ecosystem has compensated robustly for this, that resource scarcity. But now, the network has an invasive, or is it homegrown, species running amok, and the network is crawling with politicized mutant cats chasing Bernie's birdie. Fragment four, from memes to Macedonia. Clickbait, related to memes, is another business model that engages users to click on dubious stories to external websites. Clickbait stories are often fully copied and pasted from indistinguishable uh, websites of questionable or provenance and appearing, as Herman memorably describes it, quote, blended almost seamlessly into a solid wall of fleshy ad ads, close quote, hawking herpes cures and tank tops you won't believe. <laughs> In the most advanced business model Herman describes, the right-wing Liberty Alliance, stories are shared among federated partner sites. This integrated business model claims to have yielded $12 million last year from franchised Facebook clickbait. Here, engagement is at a volume that is nearly unfathomable. The phenomenon has grown so extreme and so commonplace that an enterprising group of teenagers in a small Macedonian town, you can't make this stuff up, were able to set up over 100 fake news sites targeted to fool Trump supporters, with some teens making up to $3,000 a day. On November 14th, both Facebook and Google announced that they are taking steps to bar ads on these websites. The New York Times assessed these developments as, quote, a clear signal that the tech behemoths could not ignore, or could no longer ignore the growing outcry over their power in distributing information to the American electorate, close quote. Beyond outright misinformation, which has its own effect on democratic discourse, these sites also contribute to the polarizing effect Eli Pariser has termed the filter bubble, a concept to which I will be returning. But before moving on, I want to address how these pages speak volumes in three separate senses. At least in part the result of their growing to fill the context collapse chasm, their volumetric scale and influence is obvious. So is the screaming all caps amplitude of meme messaging that reverberates in the migraine medium of Facebook's echo chamber. More subtle is Herman's contention that engagement is its own form of speech. Quote, from a user's point of view, he writes, every share, like, or comment is both an act of speech and an accretive piece of a public identity, close quote. In other words, it is not necessary to generate content in a traditional form of speech that is directly mappable to a unique speaking subject perpetuating liabilities of context collapse and intended anxieties. Such would be an outdated model of speaking, overly dependent on an anthropocentric notion of the person who speaks. In Facebook's ironically impersonal data-driven metrics, simply engaging with content speaks volumes and is another way of expressing political affiliation. It is also another way to stoke the algorithms and keep content moving. Quote, a newspaper-style story or a dry matter-of-fact headline is adequate for this purpose, Herman writes. 
But even better is a headline or a meme that skips straight to an ideological conclusion or rebuts an argument. Fragment five, communicative capitalism. This notion of circulating content in lieu of discursive interaction is a near perfect depiction of the phenomenon that the political scientist Jody Dean posits in her article, communicative, communicative capitalism, circulation and the foreclosure of politics. Dean conceives of communicative capitalism to question, quote, why in an age celebrated for its communications, there is no response, close quote. So she's actually talking about the, um, the Iraq war protests and how people uh, in government were basically like, yeah, we, you have a right to express your opinion, but didn't have to deal with that opinion. And I think that something is, this really echoes to me as a familiar mode when we hear somebody like Zuckerberg saying, it's pretty crazy. It's, very, it's this sort of dismissiveness, right? So. Dean defines communicative capitalism as, quote, that form of late capitalism in which values heralded as central to democracy take material form in networked communications technologies. Drawing on Giorgio Agamben's notion of alienated language, Dean explains how, quote, communicative exchanges, rather than being fundamental to democratic politics, are the basic elements of capitalist production. Three fantasies animate her analysis, the fantasy of abundance, the fantasy of participation, and the fantasy of wholeness. I will focus on the fantasy of participation, or sorry, the fantasy of abundance. The fantasy of abundance is marked by a shift from message to contribution, whereas conventionally communication has been formulated in terms of, quote, a message and the response to the message. Dean argues that this is no longer the case. She compares this formula with the dynamic of circulation in communicative capitalism. So in the former model, communication's basic unit is the message, and the interaction is grounded by use value. In the latter, circulation's basic unit is no longer the message, but what Dean calls the contribution, and the governing logic is one of exchange value. Moreover, communicative capitalism has an inverse relation to speaking volumes. Dean writes, quote, the more opinions out there, the less of an impact any one given one might make, and the more shock, spectacle, or newness is necessary for a contribution to register or have an impact. Dean's assessment of networked communications goes yet a step further than Herman's contention that mere engagement is a form of speech. She suggests that engagement, or in her term, participation, fundamentally transforms what is spoken. For Herman, the meaning of engagement as speech um, remains intact. So following Dean's assertion that traditionally, quote, understanding is a necessary part of the communicative exchange. But under communicative capitalism, Dean argues this is no longer so. A contribution need not be understood. It need only be repeated, reproduced, forwarded. Circulation is the context, the condition for the acceptance or rejection of a contribution. The popularity, the penetration, and duration of a contribution marks its acceptance or success. As Herman would have it, users engaging with a meme still functionally communicate a personal opinion, but absent personal content. Regardless, their political utterance carries meaning. By contrast, in Dean's communicative capitalism, the, con the contribution is first and foremost a commodity that may very well mean something, but its meaning is always secondary to its economic function. In Dean's words, quote, the fact that messages can retain a relation to understanding in no way negates the centrality of their circulation. Significantly, and echoing my earlier claim that Facebook carries an internal conflict between human and non-human, or personal and data-driven, Dean observes that, quote, just as the producer, labor, drops out of the picture in commodity exchange, so does the sender or author become immaterial in the contribution, close quote. The erasure of personal content that marks the anonymity of context collapse appears as another formulation of the immateriality of Dean's sender. And this is only the first step. 
Facebook goes even further in dropping the human, and indeed human labor, from sight. Fragment six, slaves to the algorithm. Last spring, another scandal erupted when leaked documents exposed that the supposedly objective trending news algorithm relied on a group of human editors whose job it was to vet news stories, write short headlines, and rank stories' significance. The article uncovered a beleaguered team of journalists trained at elite J schools working as contractors for trending news in a toxic, quota-driven work environment. According to a Gizmodo expose, quote, these former curators described grueling work conditions, humiliating treatment, and a secretive, imperious culture in which they were treated as disposable outsiders. After doing a tour in Facebook's news trenches, almost all of them came to believe that they were there not to work, but to serve as training modules for Facebook's algorithm. <laughs> the contractors also called news curators, described the experience as being, quote, truly slaves to the algorithm, close quote. Critics alleged that the involvement of human workers tainted trending news with subjectivity, as news curators may have ranked left-leaning stories above conservative ones, even motivating calls for a congressional inquiry. I will argue that algorithmic objectivity is a flawed conceit in the first place. We'll be coming back to this. But the public perception of bias cannot have been helped by the secrecy surrounding the team's employment. The contractors reported being isolated from the prevailing culture of Facebook employees and even being told not to list working at Facebook on their resumes. <laughs> Gizmodo ruminated as to the incentive for this obfuscation. Quote, one reason Facebook might have wanted to keep the trending news operation faceless is that it wants to foster the illusion of a bias-free news ranking process. But more recently, the New York Times reported that Facebook employees weighing Facebook's role in media in the election considered, quote, the trending topics episode to have paralyzed Facebook's willingness to make any serious changes to its products that might compromise the perception of its objectivity." Close quote. Eventually, the team's suspicions about being replaced by an algorithm were proven correct when a few months later, Facebook fired all humans from tr trending news, leaving the algorithm to do its business. However, <laughs> absent so-called human interference, trending news took a perverse twist. On its first weekend without human guidance, the, trending, the top trending news stories on Facebook included everything from outright political information, misinformation, misinformation, to an article about a video of a man masturbating with a McDonald's chicken sandwich. <laughs> and we thought cats were bad. So if you don't mind, just to put all of this in perspective, I'd like to take a sort of a sidestep um, for a short moment to an article that concerns neither Facebook nor news, but at least has the merit of moving us away from McDonald's and over to Chipotle. <laughs> a Bloomberg technology article about artificial intellig artificially intelligent personal assistants was published in April, right around the same time as the trending news team in incident. Its headline read, <laughs> the humans hiding behind the chatbots. Behind the artificial intelligence, personal assistants, and concierges are actual people reading emails and ordering Chipotle. <laughs> the subject of this article is a group of personal assistant AIs that give users the experience of automation, when in fact, not unlike the trending news team's slave-like experience, the so-called AI is a group of real people desperately scrambling behind the scenes to maintain app-like real-time efficiency. Platforms like GoButler, Clara, and XAI were intended to be actual AIs, but the technology was simply not good enough, so they had to hire humans to fill in. These examples also recall the famous 18th century mechanical Turk automaton, which was supposed to play chess on its own, but in reality required a human hiding inside to work on its behalf. 
Amazon's Mechanical Turk labor market, named for the automaton, uses a similar inverted logic by hiring humans at micro-wages to complete human intelligence tasks or hits that machine intelligence still isn't great at handling. These incidents lay bare the, ne the necessary cooperative entanglements of humans and non-humans within the realm of algorithmic labor, exposing the hypocrisy in, human, in Facebook's false division between the personal and the data-driven, the human and the non-human. To the contrary, if we tune our attention to listen closely to these situations, we hear whispers of an untapped potential for human, non-human solidarity that could overcome the prevailing oppos oppositional rhetoric. So real world conditions of optimized and automated labor show how humans and machines are mutually united in work. Far from failure, the gaping disparities in effective automation, from AI systems to the trending news algorithm, prove why solidarity with machines maybe isn't such a crazy idea after all. In these stories of automation, robots aren't so efficient that they're stealing people's jobs. Robots are so inefficient that they are forcing people to work as robots. And this, I believe, is the real story here. It's not about real versus fake content or about democratically minded human editors versus haywire havoc wrecking scripts. It's about how by privileging size first and second, algorithmic control, companies like Facebook have created large-scale techno-social capitalist systems in which humans and non-humans are functionally interchangeable and in which neither ever stands purely on its own. This is something that I think so-called accelerationist theorists are at best dangerously naive about when they advocate for automation as a supposed end of work. Automation more often results in the overall degradation of human experience in labor, as the subhuman working conditions of the news curators exemplify, and let's not kid ourselves, without question if we are to consider human work under the shadow of automation. The Ivy League news team suffered some of the rosiest conditions imaginable. Recall also how contemporary dreams of automation are originally grounded by a social context, not a purely technical one. The word robot itself derives from robota, a Czech word that first appeared in Carol Chapek's 1920 play, R.U.R., Rossum's Universal Robots. At its literal root, the meaning of robot is forced labor, serf labor, or servitude revealing how automation first meant creating machines to work slavishly on behalf of humans. The continuity is somewhat obvious now. Automation lowers the bar for slave-like exploitation applied to non-humans, but its exploitative logic bleeds over to human labor conditions too. Slaves and algorithms cut both ways. Fragment seven, parents to the algorithm. And don't worry, the fragments are going to get shorter now. Previously, we looked at, face, at a newsfeed from the perspectives of content and engagement, where we also discovered human and non-human tensions. Now, shifting focus to the algorithm itself offers a new angle on Facebook's conflict between the personal and the data-driven, playing out specifically in and around the automation of labor. With its newsfeed algorithm, Facebook attempts not merely to optimize labor, but even to cleanse it completely of human participation. Recall Dean's assertion that, quote, just as the producer labor drops out of the picture in commodity exchange, so does the sender or author become immaterial in the contribution, close quote. No algorithm is independent of human involvement. Whether this takes editorial or authorial form, Human parentage of algorithms is a responsibility that can't be shirked. There may be occasions when human intervention is direct and editorial. Zuckerberg him himself faced criticism for overriding the company's own community standards policy on hate speech to allow Trump's statements under the guise of news. 
Zuckerberg invoked Facebook's ethos of engagement and made an editorial decision to keep posts he believed counted as news that people would want to engage with. This decision itself speaks volumes about the fragility of the company's position as not a media company. But it also seems increasingly clear that these tech companies are in the business of mediating. For example, on Wednesday, uh, Twitter just announced that it was barring a number of high-profile alt-right accounts. And then, of course, and I haven't even had time to fully process this, but then there's this. So the alt-right has now decided to be fake black accounts um, to sort of reclaim their ground. Um, so, <laughs> more profoundly, all of Facebook's claims about al algorithmic objectivity um, for all, all of Facebook's claims about algorithmic objectivity, every choice made by an algorithm is also subjective. The human engineers who write algorithms direct the system's choices through their labor, or as Helen Nissenbaum and others puts it, values are encoded in design. Human biases persist in code. Despite the, fa the facade of independent machine learning, Facebook's engineers remain integral to the functioning and fine-tuning of its algorithms all the time. These technologies always have depended fundamentally on back-end human involvement, not only on front-end human engagement. Algorithms are born of and tended by human labor, but Facebook's business model intentionally obscures the ways that human choice and non-human algorithmic decision-making are intertwined. What then are the economic implications around the devaluation and invisibility of human labor? Fragment eight, algorithms as avatars or collectivity without individuality. In May of 2015, a team of Facebook researchers published an article in Science that now reads like a preemptive defense concerning Newsfeed's filter bubble effect. Not surprisingly, the researchers absolved Facebook's algorithm, attributing the filter bubble to human confirmation bias in which people affirm their existing views. Quote, individual choices more than algorithms limit exposure to attitude changing content, they wrote. The article has been roundly criticized for its insufficient methodology and reasoning, but I want to focus on what looks like a throwaway caveat in their methodology. The authors write, quote, other forms of social media, such as blogs or Twitter, have been shown to exhibit different patterns, largely because ties tend to form based primarily upon common topical interests and or specific content whereas Facebook ties primarily reflect many different online social contexts, schools, family, social activities, and work, which have been found to be fertile ground for fostering cross-cutting social ties. So I flag this passage because school, family, social activity, and work are precisely the contexts that are collapsing, yet here they appear in Facebook's own article to refute algorithmic homogenization of content. It is becoming accepted that Facebook's rules of engagement, so to speak, contribute to deeply polarized content. For example, the Wall Street Journal's Blue Feed, Red Feed project eloquently illustrates this divide, shown side by side the contrast between liberal Facebook and conservative Facebook is extraordinary. So if you haven't checked out this, um, this project, it's really worth um, taking a look. Even if Facebook's algorithm is not the sole cause, it has considerable influence in this engineered rift. How then are we to square the notion that Facebook's political ties do not reflect topical interests with the disintegration of precisely the social context they claim do support the, pl the platform's ties? I offer two speculative possibilities in which the binding force of Facebook ties takes shape through algorithmic assemblage, compositing techno-social political avatars that leverage the network's volume, but to speak in different modes. The first example is hashtags, which we, consider, we could consider to be a form of political speech that is not bound by a singular speaking subject. For example, a hashtag like hashtag Black Lives Matter 
gathers collective public utterances that cannot be traced back to a single individual. Nevertheless, this tag has become a central voice speaking to and through topical interest. An Xiaomina writes um, about how hashtags mediate affiliation, creating solidarities across physical distances at scales that can't be achieved through face-to-face -face contact alone. Emphasizing this social side of social media, the hash symbol is a symbol for affiliation. She writes, quote, the hash su visually suggests a bond and the words suggest what the bond is about, close quote. Yet the capacity of topical interest to collectivize and anonymize individuals can take far more insidious forms. In my second example, algorithms reinstate the personal as an aggregated demographic. In the terms we used earlier, the personal no longer serves as raw material, but as the product Facebook delivers to its advertisers. But advertisers are now able to aggregate this information to use the platform's volume to speak in their own interests. On October 28th, ProPublica uh, published the results of an experiment in which they discovered that Facebook's advertising system, quote, allows advertisers to exclude black, Hispanic, and other quote unquote ethnic affinities from seeing ads on the platform. And the test case they tried was a housing ad that a civil rights lawyer called, quote, about as blatant a violation of the Federal Fair Housing Act as one can find, close quote. Although Facebook calls this multicultural marketing, the company now faces a civil rights lawsuit. Fragment nine, empathy and the silent majority at full volume. What I want to suggest is that all algorithms entwine humans and non-humans. Though capitalists attempt to purge or separate humans and non-humans in labor contexts, if these algorithmic systems teach us anything, it is that these categories no longer make sense, or at least not in the ways that we have historically understood these terms. Algorithms like Facebook's newsfeed cut across these categories differently, creating other kinds of ties that arrange humans and non-humans into unfamiliar relationships. Scooping up the rubble of context collapse, these ties yoke together hybrid collective forms that take on voice to varying effects within the network's parameters. In conditions of context collapse, the volumetric mass of the network is sliced into portions that speak, often silently, and without recognizable forms of subjectivity or objectivity. One way to put this is a shift from profiles to demographics that link collectivities without the need for individuality. An example is the silent majority that so surprised me by raising its voice in this election. Considering Zuckerberg's suggestion that we tune in to their volume, in all senses of the word, with empathy, I believe that that silent majority is one such algorithmically bounded demographic. It has voiced itself not as individuals en masse, but as a demographic whole. The movements of circulation that networked this profile and summoned it into being were, by and large, not personal posts, but rather links fake news and memes, not personally authored, but collectively engaged. If we recall the anxiety in context collapse, sharing links and memes is a coping strategy because their impersonal nature preempts scrutiny and shaming. I believe that we, we are hearing the vast volume of shame. Following this election, people described quote unquote leaners um, Trump supporters who, when asked, would lean in and admit that they were voting for Trump. Yes, I think that they were duped by the massive volume of fake news. Everyone participated in this. But if I am to empathize, it is because I think they voted knowingly. In other words, not out of ignorance, but out of shame and perhaps desperation. Ironically, it was not all the angry shouting that won the, the election, but 
a shameful silence. My speculation is that this demographic is speaking volumes about the internalized inadequacies of living as slaves to the algorithm and must assume its patronage. So, in conclusion, inconclusive inclusions. So this is the part where I would like to draw a conclusion, but can't. Believe me, I really love a good, clean argument where everything comes into focus. But as I warned at the outset, that's not going to happen today. I would love to be able to say that this is all about racism, or all about misogyny, or all about classism. It's the economy, stupid. What a great meme. But the truth is, I can't. The best I can offer is the idea that what I think we are seeing in the so-called silent majority is a majority that has been rendered so big, so major, precisely because affiliative personal um, subgroupings, for lack of a better word, the subgroups of identity politics are collapsing too. I think this is a part of a greater collapse of the personal or the human that can no longer be neatly isolated from the non-human. Confronted with subsumption into a faceless, massive volume like this, people are, I think, desperately trying to reassert personal difference, sadly, in the crudest possible terms. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Uh, when you bring up Jody Dean and you talk about the commutative, commutative capitalism, capitalism yeah. um, uh, I just I, I, I want to ask if it's if the the communication is taking place uh, and that's the priority now. The, the central point of it is just the. Uh, the actual exchange of a message, not necessarily the content, if I'm understanding that mm. correctly. Uh, yeah, I mean, she, I think in her terms, yeah. but just strictly within her model, yeah. she would say that it's not an exchange anymore, even okay. really. It's, or, I mean, I guess it's like exchange value. Exchange value, but it's, okay. That there's no response, right? There's, there's no there's response, no, okay. Um, the message to just, respond, yeah. yes, exactly, exactly. It's what, sorry? The, there's no injunction to respond. No injunction to respond, okay. So, so my question then is, is there any space left for, for a kind of phatic communication mm. now, right? If, if you said even if there's no response, it still affects a kind of communication. Mm. It, is, it is a production mm. of a, a position mm -hmm. is in the sharing, right? Is the, so mm -hmm. a phatic uh, utterance being one that is merely a... Uh, acknowledgement of... Pardon me? Acknowledgement of... Uh, well, acknowledgement, it, it is a keeping open of space of communication, yeah. right? So, mm -hmm. it, and it is not, doesn't require a response of the person to say, uh-huh, uh-huh. But right. it, so I, I just want, is right. there space now at all for that kind of... Well, I mean, one way of looking at, at that, I mean, I haven't, I haven't thought about this, but one way of looking about that um, would be to, to say that space is the volume, mm -hmm. right? Like, it's, cre it's the, we've created this um, almost like volumetric cavity that is just serving as this echo chamber, and it's just getting, I mean, it's like, I feel like it's becoming like... Um, like a landfill of just <laughs> crap, hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that it's it, without the, um, and that maybe like that's what these platforms are doing, right? Is there is there maybe only phatic responses now? Uh, maybe. Or I only mean, phatic yeah. communication? I think, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to say that that's all we can have, sure. but I think that there is something about that sort of, um, yeah, I think that that's definitely the direction mm. of the platforms. Curious. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Geraldine, have a question? Yes, I really, really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. you. Really delivered, and I'm so impressed you did as intended. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, so my question, to get you to say more, is uh, uh, something you introduced right towards the end in your mm -hmm. conclusion, I think, about the shameful silence of mm -hmm. uh, the, the majority. Mm -hmm. um, can you say more about the shame here? Yeah, you know, I, I'm right yeah. with you on that, but yeah. I want to hear more about the shame. Yeah, I mean, this is sort of, this, this is my intuition, yeah. you know. Um, I do think that, you know, there was something about that silence, right, that, um, I mean, I think partly, right, um, I personally was not exposed to much of this rhetoric because of my filter bubble, both on social media that, you know, I don't have friends or family. I now have like one distant cousin of my mother's who I am now seeing posts that are pro-Trump, but I had not heard anything at all in my own Facebook feed. Um, but also because I'm in academia, I'm in New York, I mean all of these other kinds of um, ways that we sort of have confirmation bias. Like we find, we, uh, find things that affirm our own positions, right? And on some levels, we've structured, we structure our lives this way, right? Um, I think that's one reason why I didn't hear much, but I also think that there was something about this idea of these leaners that people were saying, like they weren't admitting, and I think this is why, part of why the polls were wrong, right, is that people didn't want to admit this. So I think that there's something that was repugnant, right, I mean there's, <laughs> I have plenty that's, that's Republican, Republican, right? But that people voted despite that, right? And th so they did so knowing that this, um, I don't think it's just a case of extremists, right? I don't think it's just a case of people who think, um, you know, I totally agree with all of what he, you know, with everything that he's saying. It's more, the, the bigger problem, I think, is people who, hear what he's saying and actually understand it, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they do hear and um, comprehend. This is when she says that there, when Jody Dean says that there is, there can still be understanding attached to that message. So they hear, they understand, and they vote despite that. You know, that, and that, I, I think that that knowing of, like that internal conflict about like, like which side of myself is my interest? I'm also wondering that, um, you know, it was such a shocking result, like the mm. Brexit result, mm. and it's it's people from whom we do not hear, right. who do not have for years experienced yeah. the political arena as one in which they have no voice and where they speak it doesn't matter. Yeah. And I was thinking that it's the it's the the silence, the fact that they live in silence. Mm -hmm. Right, that they're mm -hmm. skeptical and disengaged mm -hmm. or alienated from the whole mm -hmm. political, in the elite, mm -hmm. what's called the elite, which we are all members. Mm -hmm. um, that the silence itself is shown. Mm -hmm. That if you're a silent, if you're part of what's supposed to be a community and you're a silent member, it is itself shaming. Like there's mm -hmm. something else to go after. Yeah, I mean, so I haven't, um, you know, <coughs> following Brexit, I'm sort of reading a lot of news, um, I haven't followed up, but one of the things that's come out um, in the 10 days since the election is that initially I think this idea of Trump supporters, like m my mental image of Trump supporters, the red states, is like a sort of rural population that is, um, you know, that, that has been left behind by, um, by uh, global capitalism, basically, right? Oh, by um, the two parties. By the two parties, yes, by the parties as well, yeah. Um, but I think that what, um, what has come out more recently is that that's only part of the picture, that there were also, there's also this like large number of educated white women, for example, who voted for Trump, um, which surprises me. Right, that surprises me almost more. Like I can, I, it's much easier for me to say, oh, I get it. Like you know, this, like this is the argument. Like um, Bernie would have been a better candidate because he was at least addressing um, these political ideas. So yeah. David has a question, then Sarah, then Mary. Yes. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering. I mean, I think this is really good. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, I was, I was, I was also struck by the, the thought of the concept of shame, and I, I think I agree with everything that's been said, but I also wonder if the um, opposite is also true in the sense that, um, like, I wonder if the shame actually precedes the vote. So I wonder, I, I wonder to what extent <laughs> it's actually a kind of deeply seated yeah. self-loathing uh, that sort of permeate, that, that it connects to its sort of affects of, of uh, communication with communication mm. and whatnot that produces the desire to vote for Trump. So it's not, mm. it's not, I, it's not, I like this and I'm ashamed of it, but actually I'm ashamed and this is a, this is a expression. Yeah. 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 That's very interesting. Um, yeah. Like yeah. So I don't know if that, if I think that resonates for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry. So, you know. uh, first, thanks. That was fantastic. Um, and then kind of combining the, um, the idea of shame in voting with uh, what Eldridge was asking about. Uh, Jody Dean also um, talks about how the circuits of communicative exchange in, in digital media uh, are really efficient at capturing drives. And so we really do get sucked into this kind of compulsive uh, communication, that there's this injunction to communicate all the time. And she and lots of other people, going all the way back to Hannah Arendt, talk about how privacy is fundamental in forming some kind of political subjectivity. And of course, if we're all busy tweeting and sharing memes and you know just constantly shouting or typing political opinions, that doesn't leave that kind of uh, buffer space that perhaps you know, you, you're looking for um, in terms of forming political subjectivity. And so the thing is that these, the silent majorities, whether it's shy Tories or sub rows of Brexiters or the, these Trump leaners, uh, the one thing that shame just as a label for their voting motivation might be missing is perhaps that these were the only people who maintained some kind of private political sphere in which they form an understanding that we just weren't party to because we were all too busy mm. tweeting. Um. That's a really interesting idea. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. super interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 yes. <laughs> My response is yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess I think that um, that kind of buffer zone um, is the only thing I would add because I think, you know, you're... Um, your thinking is really, I think, dead on. Um, for me, that buffer zone also connects to this idea of decelerationist aesthetics. That there's, like, you know, something about giving pause to this compulsive immediacy that is like really the trend in accelerationist theory is like towards immediacy um, and towards you know they you know the accelerationists are aiming for collapse, right? Um, and I think what's interesting is that um, context collapse sort of does that, but in a decelerated way, right? And in an, and in an aesthetic way. So yeah, but I think absolutely that that buffer zone and this idea that um, maybe people the leaning the leaning uh, majority <laughs> might be trying to retain some privacy is quite interesting. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah go for it. Yeah. Thanks so much, Becker. You raised so many important issues, and I think that last point you made is an incredibly important one, which is, you know, I was trying to make the argument that this is a kind of anti-intellectual, rural, white extremist, and one of my students pointed out that actually the alt-right is made up of quite the, some of them are quite the opposite pole. They're college educated. They would have voted left, but are disenchanted or, you know, displeased. Um, so it turns out then that this alt-right is made up of, demo, it's almost like a demographic, it's not just a collapse of context, it's a collapse of critique, mm -hmm. power critique yes. on the one hand, because Traditionally, or in the in the past, if you wanted to speak out against something, you had the left there, you were a progressive, uh, the kind of progressive party. But it almost seems like the alt right's presence in influencing this election had to do with the fact that the left is no longer providing the kind of platform 
for voice that it traditionally did. So, so I think this for me is the most um, almost insidious political effect or of this election. It shows how critique itself has collapsed. And that's why it's interesting you mentioned demographics because it's almost like demographics doesn't, does no longer explain um, the various populations and kind of infiltrations of populations that came together to vote pro-Trump in this election. So I wonder if in addition to the collapse of context, you might say something about the collapse of critique mm -hmm. overall and what to do about that. <laughs> you don't have to answer the last one. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Okay. So, yes, I mean, I guess um, I think you're right that the there is a collapse of critique as well, certainly. And I think, um, you know, I guess. For me, I, I feel like, I, you know, I, what I think is interesting with the demographics, actually, maybe I'll start this way. So um, for me, one thing that's interesting with the demographics is that it's a way, like, these are no longer demographics that are um, about the things that we would associate with identity politics, right? It's a different kind of way of grouping people that has to do with basically, like, um, marketing preferences, like things you clicked, things you like, you might also want to buy, like this kind of thing, right? So this is a different, um, it's a different uh, way of thinking about what constitutes a demographic. Um, and I think that that actually, for me, relates to object-oriented feminism, because one of the things that we see in object-oriented feminism, which partly the thinking about object-oriented feminism comes out of looking at, you know, things that I felt like I would like to intervene with through um, in speculative realism, object-oriented ontology, new materialisms, right? But also things that I wanted to intervene in with the sort of with fem within feminism, right? And trying to bring those two worlds into dialogue. So um, one of the things that I think has sort of um, created a bit of a slump within feminism has been um, how feminist and queer studies has really overemphasized the subject um, through identity politics, through human rights based advocacy, right? So I think that that's something that object oriented thinking can help to mediate. And what I think is really interesting, if we take this, like, these ideas from object oriented ontology, for example, um, there's a sense that objects are objects, right? Like they're just the object. And all of these other things that we have thought of as being essential, right? And that might be a position from which to launch critique, I might also say. Those things that we think are essential qualities, um, gender being one, right? Um, but also maybe, uh, you know, race, class, like these things that are like formative to ourselves are now, we, if we use this object-oriented thinking, we can see those things as being secondary qualities of objects. So this means that they are not essential, they're mapped on. Um, and that means, to my thinking, that makes them detachable, right? That, that gives us a much more sort of networked field um, from which to then, and I think this is what these algorithms are doing, they're then reaching across, if, if these qualities are unbounded from the individual, right, from the subject, <coughs> then we can reach across and just collect these, like skim off the top these qualities, skim off the, cen the center these qualities, and make that group that, this is like the tie that binds, right, group that into its own object, its own demographic object. And then that has a position from which to speak. Does that make sense? It's absolutely, that's exactly what I mean, which is because my point is that the way critique has been articulated mm -hmm. historically has mm -hmm. very much centered and revolved around the subject. Yes. So when we don't exactly. have the subject, what happens yes. to critique? But isn't yeah. what you just described in the edits, in a way, the meme 
is in other words, it's kind of this, it's not really critique, it's just it's this the kind of taking different objects. And, you know, it, it has that kind of simulation of critique, but there's no... Right, I wouldn't call this critique. Yeah. I'm, uh, like, yeah, this is, I mean, what I'm, what I'm describing, just to, to be super clear, what I'm describing is that movement is this algorithmic movement. Uh, I don't think that's the same as critique yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the last question, and then we'll take a break. Thank you, thank you for such a wonderful and fantastic discussion. Um, I two things. One is the question of the silent majority. Isn't the silent majority actually the majority who didn't vote in all of these contexts for various mm. reasons? But the other thing is, you know, thinking about Facebook Live, yes, like it's a way of, you know, showing like his birthday parties or whatever in real time. Mm -hmm. But it's also been used as a I would argue an effective tool for advocacy and for activism. And I'm thinking about, you know, when a woman has the presence of mind to use it to record, you know, her partner being shot in front of her because she knows that she needs this evidence to stand in because she has a woman who will do these about it. So I'm wondering where the space is in, in because I love this argument about Facebook, but I'm also wondering, is it only helping on my page that, you know, an our page that we see this, that we can use these affective features as tools for advocacy and, and activism? Or is that maybe more broadly a way that Facebook is sort of being hacked? Uh, yeah, okay, so I, to, to under, I want to make sure I'm understanding your question. You're saying is the, um, is the affective pull of these Facebook videos, like, do other people see this? Is that what you're asking? Well, I'm asking, so when these affective tools that Facebook has implemented uh -huh. to uh -huh. increase personal sharing uh -huh. are used actually for explicitly political mm -hmm. reasons and for as sort of measures of safety, you know, mm -hmm. personal safety, like mm -hmm. in the videos of shootings and right. violence, you know, is, I feel like that's an effective sort of hacking of Facebook manipulation of the algorithm, yeah. and how space for that, and hacking by the algorithm. Yeah. yeah, no, I think it's, um, yeah, I think that, oh, do I think it's effective? So, I think it is a very effective at generating affect, um, but I think that I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, necessarily promote it as an effective tool. I think it's, it, yes, it is a tool, it is being used, it is being, it's like a hack of the system. But remember what happened with the Philandro Castile video, that it suddenly disappeared according, for, by a glitch. It was no longer, mm -hmm. so when you're using these platforms, it's their content. Like, this is, you know, the other, you know, everyone who gets arrested, your phone gets taken, right? The first thing, <laughs> we'll take the phone. So. Um, I think that it's, you know, I don't know how effective we can be in hacking the system because the system is proprietary, right? Um, even things like the thing about um, the FBI trying to unlock the iPhone for the San Bernardino thing. So, um, yes, I think that these can be used as tools of resistance. They can be, they can be used for, um, you know, for activist purposes. But as activists, we should be careful about relying on them because the content it isn't ours, right? It's always serving this other purpose. And it also, I mean, obviously, um, there's a whole surveillance aspect to live video also that's like a whole other discussion, you know? Um, yeah. I think we have to leave it there. But, uh, Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you.